Okay, everybody, welcome back today to another edition of the VA Sales Count Help Holistic Healing Hour. And I'm still your host and moderator. Last time I checked anyway, so far so good. Grandpa Bill, thanks for joining us. Ubiquitous audience, invited audience, a faction of each, wherever, whatever slippers may fit you, however you got here. Thank you. And thanks for being here. We continue to grow exponentially with your help. And it's real soon that we've got my next guest here. Just in a moment. In studio, champing at the bit, going to help the old timer out here. We get it around a little bit in the green room about my eyes and chronology and all that. All good. John Lata, who is indeed an author, teacher, mystic, (laughs) a storyteller with a great sense of humor. And he's going to need one tonight. I teased him (laughs) a little bit. I appreciate that good sense of humor. We just arbitrarily picked one of his suggested titles tonight, calling it Today at taping, tonight at taping, whenever you guys and gals hear it. Navigating spiritual transformation while living an everyday life. And quickly, I'm going to repeat his bio. Some of you may have heard the Prelude Show. I'm going to go off camera to myself. I know you guys wish you could go off camera and not see me, no such luck. Biography quoting verbatim, John David Lada. He's a mystic author, teacher, and former founder and CEO of a multi-million dollar consumer products company. He shares intimate and personal stories and teaches workshops on leadership, healing, transformation, awakening, love, synchronicity, and wisdom that unite and expand human experience. He lives with his wife that we just talked about, a little inside joke. I'm going to get him out of here so I don't get in trouble with his wife so he can keep a dinner engagement a little bit. <laughs> he lives with his wife, Wendy, in Redmond, Washington. And you can indeed visit him at his website, johndavidlata.com. We're going to let him pick it up from there and tell us all about John Lata. Thank you, John, for being here. And please do take it away. Thank you for um, being here. Thank you, welcome. Bill. And that was welcome. a hell of an intro. Appreciate the uh, the introduction. I appreciate the invitation to be on your show. Much deserved in your part on both cases. My pleasure. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Ah, thank you. Well, let's see the topic. Uh, I think you said uh, what spiritual transformation while living an everyday life, something just like that. Just to pick one. Yeah, just to get the yep. proverbial ball rolling, if yeah. you will. Sure. Well, and I, I, it's a great title for me because that really has been my life for the last 20 years. And um if I were to just dive right in, so uh, up until about 20 years ago, I was this rigid, rational, masculine, hardworking, competitive dude uh, who didn't believe in anything spiritual or religious. I thought it was all airy fairy. I just thought it was make believe. I wasn't antagonistic towards it. I just wasn't interested in it. And then, like a lot of people, uh, I went through a period of time where, where my relatively charmed life went completely off the rails and everything that could go wrong all went wrong at the same time. Uh, my wife got cancer, came completely out of left field. Um, she was in her 30s at the time and was healthy, took good care of herself. And all I know is literally two weeks after the diagnosis, they did major surgery, took her whole thyroid gland out, and every day for the rest of her life has to take a pill just to live. And, um, and she changed a lot as a result of that, started reading books about God and the meaning of life. And I think she was reviewing her own life. You know, it it happens when people are confronting the mortality through cancer. Uh, She had to go through multiple uh, radioactive iodine treatments, which required her being sequestered away from all people for two weeks at a time. It's kind of a strange form of chemotherapy. And at that same time, I'd left my very secure job uh, being a uh, a store manager for a large regional grocery chain. I'd managed a bunch of different stores and decided to quit, start my own company and promptly lost all of our money. And uh, to the I, two I, of la- s- I laugh. I'm sorry. I laugh not to insult you. Yeah. Been there, done that. Go continue, okay. continue, continue. Hey, you're a sole proprietor. You probably know. Uh, mine was over the top. I, I went $650,000 in Ouch. debt. I mean, borrowed against the house, a quarter million back when you could do this in credit card debt, uh, you know, I got an SBA loan. I mean, all the money was gone. The company was growing like crazy, but I wasn't making any money. And, um, and then at the same time, I don't know where it came from. Suddenly I had this horrifying fear of death and I'd never thought about death before. I'd never really thought about what happens when you die. 
Mm -hmm. And keep in mind at this time, I'm probably age 39 or 40. And because I've been sort of anti-religious and anti-spiritual for so long, I didn't have a foundation or a belief system to fall back on. Correct. And plus I was so proudly anti-religious and anti-spiritual that um, I would have been probably too proud to even talk to anybody about it. And so in the middle of all this turmoil, my wife decides she wants a whole new life and leaves and says, you take the kids, you're the better parent, see you goodbye and takes off mm -hmm. to start a whole new life. So now I've got a nine-year-old and 11-year-old custody of them, a business that's teetering on bankruptcy every single day. I cannot wow. figure out how I'm going to get through this. And behind closed doors, I'm terrified of death. And so um, I had been reading Michael Crichton, the author. I don't know if you're familiar with Michael oh, yeah. Crichton. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I love his books. Well, a lot of people don't know he wrote a nonfiction book called Travels. And I love that book. And in that book, and I identified a lot with Michael. He was highly intelligent, highly logical. And um, and he went through his own sort of midlife crisis uh, very strangely. And, um, and in the story, he talked about how I'm going to start exploring things in my life I've only read about. And I'm not going to take the word of others and other people's stories and books. I'm going to go try it for myself. So he went to his first ever spiritual retreat. And I loved reading the stories of his experiences there. And, uh, and he went to a, it was a very eminent physician turned spiritual teacher. So he seemed like a very safe start for your first ever spiritual retreat. And so uh, in the middle of everything going wrong in my life, I must have read that story for the hundredth time. I threw the book aside. I ran to the computer, wondered if this guy was still eating the same retreat that Michael Crichton went to 20 years earlier. And there he was on the internet. And it looked like he was teaching the exact same retreat. And so I signed up on the spot. I justified it by saying I'm $650,000 in debt. Another couple thousand isn't going to matter. <laughs> really and I booked a at ticket. That point, right? At that yeah. point, right? Booked a ticket, got my parents to watch my kids, and I went. And Bill, everything in my life started to change, even when I signed up for the workshop weird synchronicity started to happen. I, I'm i flying to the retreat on the plane and as the plane is touching down, I'm nervously looking out the window, you know, mildly nervous that it was going to be some strange guru guy and trusting that Michael Crichton's uh, description of his time there was going to be how it was for me too. And I look over and the woman sitting next to me is reading the retreat leader's book, <laughs> yeah, <I'm telling laughs> which had come funny. out like 20 years earlier. And the only right. two people on the plane going to this retreat are me and her. And she was a cute little grandma from Kalispell, Montana, and she's checking me out and I'm checking her out. Yeah, so and we both decided, okay, you look normal. Well, you look normal. Okay, maybe this is going to be okay. I'm really nervous. Hey, I'm really nervous too. And so that was the beginning of every freaking thing in my life possibly changing. That's a meeting that was meant to be right there. That's a meeting yeah. that was meant to be right yeah. there. That's amazing. Yeah. Continue, continue. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I go to the retreat, and I don't have a bunch of crazy spiritual experiences, right. but what I did discover was how much I had kept other people at a distance. I don't think I'd ever been truly close with another person, truly honest with another person, truly vulnerable with another person. Now, I had been management my whole life, which means I'd spent, I'd literally been bossing people around since age 18, <laughs> so, That's but tough. still, I... That's I had tough. not really experienced true vulnerability and true honesty with other people before. And I craved it and I really liked it. Um, the retreat ends. I go home. A bunch of other strange synchronistic experiences happen during the retreat, but maybe I'll come back to that later. Right. And so I go home and I still have all the same problems. It's still just as difficult. It's hard to describe, but somehow that retreat, everything felt just a little lighter. I don't know how to put it into words. They were all still there, all the same problems. And then um, not too long after that, the retreat leader created a dream forum online. And he said that he thought dreams were sacred. And he worked a lot with dreams at the workshop. And, um, and if I had dreams, I didn't generally pay attention to them or remember them, but he gave us an exercise. And I tried it, you know, a few days for, I forget, it was maybe a week or two. And all of a sudden I start to have dreams. I start to remember dreams. And anybody that's ever started on dream work knows it's one thing to actually remember the dream because they can slip through your fingers really quickly. It's another thing to figure out what the heck that dream is trying to tell you. And I, I went online to the dream forum and there were some really sophisticated dream workers there. And I put my dream up and I could not figure out 
how they were drawing the conclusions that they were. Correct. And so for me, it was like learning Chinese. It was like learning an entirely new language, a language of symbols, a language that sometimes required me to use intuition, which I was also just beginning to delve into and had probably never Correct. used before. Correct. And, um, and so that went on for probably a couple of years. I had started what they call a heart centered meditation practice. Correct. And Correct. Uh, it's really just sort of sitting for 20 minutes, kind of focused on unconditional love. Correct. And my life was sort of uneventful. And then came uh, the strangest thing that ever could have happened to me. And I didn't even know it was possible. So I told you I owned a multi-million dollar consumer products company that was the sales were great, but the profit was not there. And, Correct. Correct. And, um, <clears throat> but I had the opportunity to appear on QVC, the home shopping network. Right. And uh, that was a big opportunity. They told me that we would have 700,000 new viewers every minute. And so I had, I literally had a little under 10 minutes to make my pitch Correct. And uh, I was excited, nervous, never been on live TV before. So, and so I flew to the East coast. I flew right. to the Philadelphia airport. Uh, my hotel was in Philadelphia and drove over to the QVC headquarters. Didn't screw up on live TV, which was a miracle and sold a fair amount of product. Not a lot, but not a little kind of in between. Well, I go to bed um, and I can't sleep. Now keep in mind, I have just flown in from Seattle and I have to leave at 5 a.m. the next day. So my body is all screwed up. Time, because I'm time, three, yeah. time three hours. Yeah. yeah. And and I feel all this um, bill joy in my body. And I just assuming I'm really happy because I didn't screw up on TV and I was really right, nervous. Right. That's, a, that's something to be real happy about. Yeah. Continue. Continue. Yeah. So um, I'm laying in bed, dozing, trying to force myself to go to sleep, but I can't because I have to get up really early. And I'm, you know, I'm like, come on, I have to run and fall asleep. And all of a sudden, I have the strangest experience. It feels like I have an orgasm in my perineum area of my body. And this beautiful, pleasurable energy shoots up my spine and goes throughout my whole body. I don't even know would, how to describe it. Can I stop it. you was, there? Would you would you yeah. classify that as Kundalini or not necessarily? That's, you're that's, way ahead of me, but that's exactly where I was going. So okay, I didn't continue, even know continue, continue. at that time, I didn't even know what the word meant. I'd heard right. it, but I thought it was right. like yoga or something. Right. <laughs> so it continues every, let's say every three to five minutes, this unbelievably pleasurable sensation and this poof, this beautiful, like I called it orgasmic honey <laughs> going through my whole right. body right. and went on for hours. And I finally had to get up shake all the energy off and just right. try to sleep for an hour or two, got in the plane, flew home, emailed a bunch of people from that original retreat and, and asked them what the heck is happening to me. And they all said, sounds like Kundalini. Why don't you look it up? So I looked it up. I bought some books and, and now that was exactly what was happening to me. And it went on, it went on for years, Bill, but it was probably most intense the first six months. And what would happen is I would go to bed at night, and about every second or third night, I would call it the energy. The energy would come and do all sorts of crazy things with my body, which is unbelievable. And some of them were unbelievably pleasurable. And some of them were unbelievably horrifically painful. Literally felt like heart paddles, you know, shocking my body. Right. Intense dreams. My dreams were full of beautiful goddesses, tons of serpents, giant cobras. Yep. <laughs> A lot of things I later learned were kind of associated with Kundalini. Exactly. And, <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. And and um, and then I started having all these strange experiences, uh, not just in bed when I was laying there half asleep, having this right. energy show up. Um, I started. Um, gosh, I'll tell you. I mean, this is the kind of the random things that would happen. I'd go out in public and I'd be at a restaurant with my family and maybe friends. And this tremendous energy would come up into my body and flow out me into the waitress. <laughs> you know, I just you know, the energy would just do it. And, and weirdly, within one week, Bill, I became a healer, even though I, as I knew myself to be, wasn't doing anything. The energy knew exactly what to do. Your, your chakras were firing on all points and yeah. all cylinders and you emanated that. That's awesome. Continue. Yeah. Continue. Well, that's yeah. And so. Anyway, that got to happen very randomly and sporadically. This tremendous energy would move through me on behalf of somebody else. Like it seemed to know, you know, who it wanted to help. 
And, um, and then you know, I'll give you an example. One time I took my daughter and her little friends out to a Chinese restaurant. So I've got like me and three little nine or 10 year old girls sitting in a restaurant and there's a tall Asian waitress waiting on our table. And I'm just staring at her. She's not very attractive. She's kind of tall, slope shouldered, but buck tooth, you know, and she walks through the little swinging doors into the kitchen. And when she walks back out, she transforms into, I don't know how to put this into words, the most beautiful creature imaginable, like the most beautiful woman on earth. I don't even know how to put it into words. And it's like, I'm just struck by her beauty. And then she goes back to her normal self. And I'm looking around the restaurant, like, did anybody else see that? You guys saw that, right? No, they're all just still chattering away, (laughs) you know. And so... And what I what's okay, in this, so what's in this chowder? What, oh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> oh, whatever, whatever, whatever. I'm, I'm teasing. Yeah. I'm teasing. Continue. Yeah. Continue. And so what? Here's what I think happened to me. And again, some of these things, when people are in them, don't make any sense. It's only later looking back. But I lived a sort of uh, very what I would call left brain masculine sort of view of life. Right. And I think this Kundalini energy it was bringing. Uh, an entire, entirely new for me anyway, white being in the world that I'm just going to call feminine. And when I look back at my life, it was the strangest thing in the world. Like suddenly I'm a single dad with custody to my two kids. So in some ways I felt like I was both father and mother to my and kids. And you most assuredly were, of course. Yep. Yeah. And then course. I was in a group therapy process that used to have a bunch of guys in it and they all disappeared. And I was the only guy with like 10 women and two women therapists. And they were always getting on me about doing things I didn't know how to do. Uh, right. John, you're so good at doing, you should try being. I'm like, being? What the hell is that? You know. And then the Kundalini energy was just full of all these goddesses. And I would have dreams of uh, women taking over my house and even locking me out of it sometimes. So... You know, I remember I I've said I used some, to be. I've heard some. I've heard some pretty, pretty, pretty variant stories about it. Yeah. It's, it's it's always good to hear more. I love it. Yeah. Well, and then um, I was a. You remember in my first career, I was a grocery chain, you know, grocery right. store manager, and so I would have dreams. <laughs> I'd gone back to my old job at the grocery store, but now women were running the store. <laughs> <laughs> and they kept saying, there's a, there's oh, it's okay, Nile John. Nine. There's a spill yeah. of Nile 9. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Yeah. I'm teasing. Yeah. No. And then, so then it was like the women were going to, they kept saying, don't worry, John, we're going to show you how we do things around here now. And so this went on, like I said, six months intense. It went on for years. I had so many experiences. I put a lot of them into that, my book, uh, The Synchronicity of Love. And, um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of just, you know, we're coming back to this subject of what is it like to have a spiritual transformation when you're living in everyday life? I mean, my God, I'm a single dad with two kids. I'm coaching their ball teams, trying to be involved in their life at school. I own a chemical company, for God's sakes. And yet, um, so like, you know, one time I came home from work early and I was just tired and the kids would get off the school bus at 4 p.m., Uh, just like clockwork. And I just try to squeeze in a little nap before they got off the bus. And what would happen to me every time I do this, I would fall asleep and within less than a minute, just be in this profound visionary dream. I'm like, uh, one, I'm laying there in bed and this beautiful, sexy goddess is spooning me from behind. And she's got her long slender fingers wrapped around me. And I see I have a radio dial in the middle of my belly and she's adjusting the dial to try and like a radio dial, trying to find a really subtle station. And every now and then when she finds it, my body just erupts into bliss. And then she'd lose the station and try and find it again. And then, then the all of a sudden, frequency, then the damn frequency comes in, right? I'm teasing. Well, I'm teasing. And then, I'm teasing. then the, no, then the dang doorbell rings. I'm like, hey, I gotta worse. go. My even kids worse. are home from hey, school. Even worse. Yeah. 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 So that was what my life was like. Just yeah. one day after another, just strange, surreal and try and in now when I look back, it was all fine. But at the time that was my biggest fear was that something was going to make me weird and I wasn't going to be able to parent my kids or wasn't going to be able to run my chemical company. And, and in truth, it, you know, the, that it, the energy had an intelligence of its own. And if you're a Christian out there listening, I'm totally happy with it, calling it the movement of the Holy spirit. I think all yep. cultures have some, name for every now and then for some people and a tremendous amount of energy comes over them. Uh, and I think in my case, it was intense because I was so one-sided and I think it was trying right. to push me 
into right. more wholeness. And um, yeah, so that was my greatest fear is it gonna make me weird. The only thing that ever happened uh, was uh, sometimes it would keep me awake most of the night and I'd be really tired the next day, but it was like it even knew. And so then it would not come for a night or two. It's like, okay, we're gonna let you catch up on some sleep. Right. Okay, now we're gonna push you again. <laughs> That's a, and, that, that, it's such it's such an interesting cycle. Whatever we call it, sometimes here at the show we we'll call it oversoul, whatever, the higher power, a yeah. little bit angels, yeah. whatever, however it manifests yeah. itself for everybody. Yeah. But when you start to hear them, listen to them, take heed, manifest, see the dreams, yeah. all of it, it's so interesting because don't you think, John, that it has so much to do with how we were conditioned to everything to the contrary? Just about. Yes. Just about. When you stop and think about it, when that proverbial yeah. light sensation and it all comes on, we're, we're especially men. I mean, especially men, right? Got to be the, yeah. <laughs> got to be tough and strong and the hunter yeah. and the gatherers and you yeah. can't have any sensitivity, but that's how, that's how we were trained. That's how we were conditioned. Yeah. And then if something started to deviate and your world starts to unfold around you at the same time, you go to what you knew and or know, and it can be a proverbial fecal cauldron at that point, needless to say. Right. Yeah. yeah. It uh, you're exactly right. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, at least in my experience, part of being, uh, a masculine guy who's supposed to act a certain way, men yep. are supposed to be in control and, you know, yep. in charge. And, yep. and boy, there's ever a time in my life, I was like, what the hell is going to happen next? And when you are truly, when you are truly lost, even, even sometimes it is only like a moment in time, if you will, but it seems so personified and it can be for years and months. Of course, of course. But yeah. right in that fragment of time, it's like, Oh my God, this is insurmountable. This is insurmount yeah. that that feeling of just what the hell do I do now? What what the hell yeah. do I do now? That's a pretty pivotal crossroad. You know, you can go one of two ways, obviously. Yeah. And it, sometimes that road to the left, if you will, isn't the, the greatest choice. So thank God you had the right enlightenment, guidance, oversoul, angel, higher power, whatever it was, you had some help getting there, don't you think? Yeah, I, I'm happy with calling it all of those things. And yep. um, and so what I did learn over time, and I got to admit it's still with me today, is a certain amount of trust in the unfolding and the process. And there's some things you might say I'm in charge of. And there's some right. other things that there's some whatever you want, all those names you gave me, they they see more than I do. They're in charge of certain things. And so um, I have learned to just roll with things. Um, you know, I don't really have sometimes now and then, but I don't really have much of those energetic experiences anymore. And I have to tell you, this is the next thing they don't tell you on the spiritual journey. So if any of your listeners are, because you would be amazed how many people read my book and they're like, wow, how can I get some of those Kundalini experiences? And the yeah, right, is, yeah, exactly. I have no you, dang where idea. Up, where do I sign up for that? <laughs> yeah, well, and it is exciting and it is fun and it is scary yeah. sometimes. Yeah. But then then here comes, you know, for all of us intensity seekers and intensity lovers out there, what happens when all those energetic experiences and all those visions start to fade? And they did. And nobody, so first of all, nobody told me Kundalini was a, a thing, a real thing that could happen to people. And the next thing right. nobody told me was it goes away after a while, or at least right. it becomes more and more subtle. Exactly. And that was a difficult time too. Uh, and it, it honestly, it led me to a book that was wonderful called dark night of the soul. And right. that actually is one of the definitions of a dark night is somebody feels honestly kind of special. You kind of feel chosen by God. All these crazy, cool things are happening. And then they all disappear and, and they just, I don't want to say disappeared completely, but it was like 95% of all the excitement slowly went away. And in some ways that was the most difficult time of all, you know, there's this desire to get it back, to get it back. And I, I ended up years after the fact, uh, I consulted with a guy who wrote a book probably came out about three or four years ago maybe five years ago called, I think it was called Kundalini and, and uh, he's a Western guy, you know, lives in the U S and wrote kind of a PhD, you know, kind of 
sub on the subject of Kundalini. And I talked to him by a zoom and he said, well, you know, the goal ultimately of all Kundalini awakening is what you call union with the divine. And so right. what will happen is, uh, your inner world does become more and more subtle. So all the really gross, intense energetics start to fade. And it's like, ah, oh, okay, I guess that's good, but man, I miss them. <laughs> and like I said, I'm not saying I don't have the occasional cool vision and dream, but the big wham, bam, like, oh my God, what's going to happen tonight? What's going to happen when I go into a restaurant now? What's going to happen you know, healing, you know, this tremendous energy that would go through me on behalf of others, uh, it started to fade. And so that was a really difficult phase, but you know, it's hard to put into words. I had so many unusual dreams and experiences in a way it's almost makes sense that, um, it's almost like you get downloaded a whole bunch of stuff and now you have to kind of integrate it and embody it. And they, they, it's sort of like, you just can't keep reading a new book every day. At some point, you got to take some of that stuff you're learning and put it into practice. And so Absolutely. when I finally figured that out, I stopped being so upset that <laughs> that it was it just wasn't the same it used, as it used to be. I, I you know, I, I have encountered this so many times, an, an alcoholic, kind of a crazy wild, likes to drink, party, likes to drink a lot. And then screw it, I'm going to quit drinking. But they almost always replace that addiction with another addiction because they love the intensity of it. They love the, you know, whatever it is they get from it. So it might go from drinking to gambling or from gambling to sex or from sex to intense athletics. And it's truly and, chemical. It's truly chemical in the brain. Yeah. Having, having been a roof, I'm an alcoholic, but not an active one, but having been there, done that. It, it really truly is. It's a chemical reaction and you do substitute. You do, you do, you do. You yeah. Do. Well, <laughs> You do, you do, you do. I, I wasn't intense like that. Yeah. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. I, I known people way more intense than me, but I had some of that in me too. I liked to gamble when I was really young. I spent way too many years when I was in my early twenties at the horse races. I, uh, I used to like to drink a little too much. Um, yep. I used and to then, do, and I then did, not to, not to interrupt, but to interrupt. And then if you, you know, things are going good career wise and you got a little yeah. bit of scratch or whatever, Oh boy, you can get into trouble real fast, can't you? If you're not careful, <laughs> if you're not careful, yeah. been there, done that, been there, done that. Well, and then I I, I started getting rid of the unhealthy addictions and started. Right. Uh, I did triathlons and kind of excessive exercise and working out and you know playing basketball three times a week with people half my age and <laughs> that'll get you in, that'll get you in shape real quick. Good for yeah, you. yeah. Good for you. So. Good for you. I think I was kind of wired towards that kind of intensity. And when it started to fade, it was, I admit it was sad. I kept like, Oh, how can I get this back? So, but I, I'm at peace with it now. Now that first revelation of the Kundalini, I'm sorry. Was that many years was, ago now? Yeah, now. it was actually, I can tell you exactly. It was the first Monday night in August, 2004 in a hotel room in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay, what was the temperature and what did the waiter have on? That's pretty good recall. That's pretty <laughs> I good. I do not recall. remember that. That's I pretty good. That. I'm teasing you a little bit, but that's pretty good recall. Good for you. Well, that's a major life event. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's yeah. like a birth of a child. It, it, it is a birth of a child in a different yeah. connotation. It is a birth yeah. of a child. Yeah. Well, so tell us about the books for sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the book I have now that came out um, middle of last year is called The Synchronicity of Love, Stories That Heal, Transform, and Awaken. It's yep. 119 short uh, true stories, mostly true stories, um, about what has taken place in my life in the last 20 years. And it really begins with my life falling apart, going to that retreat, learning to... Um, remember and try to interpret my dreams, then the Kundalini awakening and, and everything that happened. And so, and, and because kind of like the subject matter, like a spiritual transformation while in everyday life, I tried to weave some everyday stuff in there too. You know, the ups and downs of my business, being a single parent, um, some, you know, challenges with my kids, you know, life, <laughs> as, if, life, yeah, as if life, life isn't hard enough. You got yeah. all this crazy energy going on, on the side too. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, 
oh my god so um yeah that's what the book is and you can find uh, the synchronicity of love on amazon barnes and noble and i found out recently it's at target and walmart too awesome and if someone wanted to reach out to you what would be the best way to do so uh, probably my website, johndavidlatta.com. My last name is spelled L-A-T-T-A. So johndavidlatta.com. So I got information about my book. Uh, I started teaching again in person uh, here in the Seattle area. They're probably uh, almost a year behind everybody else as far as shutting everything down for COVID. Right. So I think finally the masks are off. People are gathering in person again. So I've started teaching um, classes and workshops in person. And I think I started at the end of February this year and I've been teaching probably, uh, two or three a month ever since then. And I'm so, I bet the students are glad to see yourselves, a plural as the academic professors and what, and I'll bet you're glad to see the students as well after that craziness. Yeah, it is actually really fun gathering in person. Oh, of again. course it is. If you can't, yeah. you cannot replace belly to belly, if you will, if yeah. you will, yeah. with every due respect in that word, belly to belly. Yeah. But yeah, it, there's nothing like it. So we all had a pretty tough stretch of that for a number of reasons. Yeah. Being the hibernation, being the bears that were not, <laughs> and having to hibernate like that, it definitely had a sweep. The good thing out of something bad that we all always try to look at. Many people got more creative, innovative, and started new careers. And so there's, a, there's something good that can come out of this invertedness in the crazy world right now. And I want to I keep agree. you on your dinner date. You have an open okay. invite to come back here. Point being, I'd love to have my guests, especially now where the world's a little tipsy topsy turvy. And we definitely don't work on fear factor, and we want to reemphasize that. John, what would you say, you, you know, words of wisdom, you know, food for thought, what have you, yeah. of where we should approach where we are at the precipice right now and where it, how good it can be if we all do it together the right way? What would your, what would your pearls of yeah, wisdom well, be? My words of wisdom based on my own life experience is... Um, so I love to tell this story, although it never happened to me, but imagine if you're like four years old and you get attacked by a big black dog and, uh, you know, he viciously bites you, maybe even scars you. And, you know, it'd be entirely normal uh, to be afraid of big black dogs for the rest of your life. And you might even start a Facebook page that's anti-dogs and you're, turn you into a cat person. So and so... And this is how we all are. We learn from our experiences and we learn a lot, especially in childhood. But I think it's incumbent upon us as we get older to say, okay, well, maybe that is how I see this, but maybe I'm willing to open my mind and see it differently now. And so I kind of describe it as without knowing it, we learn from experiences and we think, okay, that's how this is. And that's how this is. And that's how this is. And so in a way, we kind of build brick walls around ourselves. But I think later in life, we can start to take down some of the bricks and say, okay, I've always seen it that way. I've always believed this. I've always, you know, but maybe I'm willing to see it differently now. Maybe I'm willing to open my mind because I think that's how we evolve and grow. And I think that's how life can become more interesting and rejuvenating and revitalizing. And so uh, I know there's a lot of turmoil in the world right now. And it's sometimes when there's a lot of fear and turmoil, people retreat back to what they know. They kind of get stuck and locked in their positions. But I would recommend that if you can, relax, breathe, open your mind and allow yourself to evolve and grow. And because I actually think that that's what the world needs more than anything. It doesn't need people entrenched, refusing to give up their belief systems. And, you know, and, you know, I know for a fact that all big black dogs are mean. Well, maybe not. Maybe it was just that one dog that was having a bad day. And so that would be my words, words of wisdom. Thank you. And I'm going to just expand upon that about the dog syndrome. I'm going to date myself, but going back to the little rascals, the old series. <laughs> and by the way, no, I wasn't a child at that time to watch it as it was being produced. All you wise guys. <laughs> but, but remember Petey? Remember Petey? And yeah. the old and years later, all pit bulls are terrible, and oh my God, they're killers and all of that. Yeah. No, they're, no, they're not. No, they're not. And your analogy of black dogs or races of people, colors of skin, we can get as crazy as we want to get. Yeah. We're, we're all yeah. in this thing. We're all in this thing together. 
And those of us of the humanoid persuasion, it has to be together. It has to be. Together. I agree. Yeah. So I'm going to sign off to the people today, everybody. Thanks for joining us each and every day, as always. And thank you. And do continue to pay it forward. We are growing exponentially. And thanks to provocative guests like John. We're having, you know, exchanging our own audiences. And John has an open invite. We just joked around how busy each of us are in the green room. And before we all know it, it'll be December and end of another calendar year. And we'll all be saying, where did those five, six months go? So we'll invite John back at a time that's opportune for both of us. And we'll say bye-bye for now. And may God bless everybody. And good Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. I'll be right here waiting for you tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Peace. Thank you.